let me begin by saying that I think 30 years of ministry has a lot more to say about the churches than it does actually about me. Uh, God has blessed me incredibly by allowing me to be with churches from Oklahoma to Texas to Alabama to Illinois to now California that have always treated me much better than I deserve. And I am so grateful for, to God just for allowing me to be around people who have poured into me who have encouraged me, who have been patient with me, who have loved me with the love of Christ in a way that has uh, been so incredibly humbling uh, and inspiring to me and has helped me see Jesus in the way people live. And I, I'm very, very grateful for that. And as I begin this next season of ministry, I've got to tell you, I can't think of another church that I would rather be with than the Campbell Church of Christ. I am uh, incredibly thankful uh, to be here in this place at this time of my life, and I thank you for welcoming me and, and just allowing me to be a part of your family so quickly. And I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful to be able to minister with the people that I get to minister with every single day. Uh, just incredible talent and, and character and, and spirit. I, I'm just overwhelmed by it, and energy. They have energy running out of their ears, and it, and it keeps me going, and I'm grateful for that. But at the same time, I have to say, it can be a little bit humbling working around a couple of 20-year-olds. Uh, every once in a while, I'm reminded of that. This past Monday, we were in staff meeting, and Lauren made the statement, something around the, the fact that she couldn't imagine working with the same group of people for 17 years. That, that was just beyond her comprehension. And so at the end of the meeting, I said something in response to her as to, obviously, she didn't plan on working with us that long. And then Lauren said to me, Sean, do you really think you'll be here in 17 years? She said, you will be 70 years old, which one, that's not true. I will only be 69 and a half. And two, she said it to me like, you're going to be with Jesus at that point, <laughs> which was humbling. <laughs> but I love them. I love the team. I, I love what God's doing in the, this place. I love this church. And so thank you so much for allowing me to be your minister. Uh, let's start this way this morning. Are any of you Disney fans? Yeah, okay, if you are, stand. If, if you're a big Disney fan, go ahead and stand this morning. Do any of you think you're probably the biggest Disney fan in this room? Go ahead, stay standing, stay standing. No, 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 everybody got to keep standing. I know you're pointing at people, okay, but we're going to do something. I need you, if you're a Disney fan, stay standing for me. Oh, wait, everybody sit down on me. Come on, participate with me real quick. All right, I'm not sure who is. I, I kind of imagine Tim Parker still standing. Yeah, I kind of figure he thinks he is. I'm not sure. People are pointing. I've been told not to mention any names this morning. So I think we all think it's the same person. But we're going to find out. I want to know who the truth of this. So I'm going to make some statements uh, that relate to being a Disney fan. If what I say is true of you, remain standing. If it's not, go ahead and sit down. Okay? And, and, Please know that this comes from the All Ears website about being a true Disney fan. So this is legit, all right? So here, here we go. Here's statement number one. Remain standing if you've been to, Dis to a Disney theme park more than once. We lose anybody? No, we're good so far. Okay. Remain standing if you have clothing with something Disney on it. Okay, lost a few there. All right, remain standing if you have a music playlist made up of all Disney songs. Okay, here we go. Remain standing if you have a subscription to Disney Plus. All right, remain standing if you've dressed up as a Disney character for Halloween or just because you wanted to. We're down to four or five, oh, a few more than that, all right. Remain standing if you get misty-eyed when you see the castle. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Remain standing if you know where the hidden Mickeys are in the parks. Wow. 
All right, remain standing if you have a pet named after a Disney character. That's pretty good, all right. We'll leave it right there. We could keep going, but we'll leave it right there. Very good. All right, some big Disney fans in the audience, but there is one person that I know of that has a passion for Disney second to none. I want to introduce you to George Rieger. This is George Rieger. In a TV interview, this is what George Rieger said about his love for Disney. He said, I have a saying for my life, NBD, nothing but Disney. Everything else in my life comes second, including family. In the same interview, Rieger shared that he spends upwards of $50,000 a year on Disney-related activities. His entire house is decorated in Disney. At the time of this particular TV interview, he had roughly 20,000 Disney-related items in his collection. He had somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,600 Disney characters tattooed on his body. Now, is it just me, or does that seem a little wacky to you? <laughs> does it make a whole lot of sense to devote your entire life to a floppy-eared mouse and his friends? That's certifiable nuts, in my opinion. But let me ask you this. Does it make any more sense to devote your life to the son of a Jewish carpenter who was executed like some godforsaken criminal on a Roman cross. Festus didn't think so. Now, who is this Festus character? Well, Festus replaced Felix as the governor of Judea. We talked about Felix last week. Felix was that guy who was kind of tied up in money, power, and sex. At a certain point, he left his position as governor. Festus came in and replaced him. And of all the problems he had inherited at that particular time, one of those problems was a prisoner of the state by the name of Paul. Festus wasn't exactly sure what to do with this guy by the name of Paul, but after listening to Paul talk about his faith in Jesus Christ, he came to this one certain conclusion that, that Paul was completely out of his mind. I want you to listen to the words that Festus said to Paul in Acts chapter 26 and verse 24. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. Are there any Festuses in our world today? People who view Christians as simpletons, if not complete whack jobs. Of course there are. Uh, famous and not-so-famous people have been quick to claim that those who are followers of Jesus Christ are weak-minded, if not a threat to society. I want you to listen to the words of comedian, TV celebrity Bill Maher. He says this about religion in general, but if you've paid attention to him at all, you know how he feels about Christianity. He says this, We're a nation that is unenlightened because of religion. I do believe that. I think that religion stops people from thinking. I think it justifies crazies. I think religion is a neurological disorder. Is Mar alone in this viewpoint? Not by a long shot, right? I, I imagine there are a number of people in the Silicon Valley that hold this exact same view. So how do you witness for Christ to those who view our faith as bizarre, if not dangerous. Well, this morning we're going to look at Paul and how he witnessed to both Festus and King Agrippa II. Now, why are we going to do this? We're going to do this because I believe Paul models for us a sane approach that is worthy of imitation. Now, I've shared with you a little background information on Festus. Let me give you a little background information on King Agrippa II. King Agrippa II was the great-grandson of Herod the Great, who was responsible for ordering the slaughter of every male under the age of two to try to rid the world of a newborn king by the name of Jesus. His uncle was Herod Antipas. 
Herod Antipas was the individual who was responsible for serving up the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. His father, King Agrippa I, is the one who is believed to be responsible for running a sword through James, the son of Zebedee. To say this family didn't think highly of Jesus and his followers is an understatement. Now, our natural tendency in a hostile environment is to be a bit defensive, if not snarky, right? But not Paul. As Paul sets out to share his faith, he leads with a humble spirit. Acts chapter 26, verse 2 and 3. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Here Paul models what he later emphasized to the church at Colossae in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5 and 6. He said, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Anytime we're given the opportunity to share our faith in Jesus Christ, we should express appreciation, respect, humility. Even if we know we're speaking to those who view our faith as being somewhat suspect, or they think poorly of us. Is that easy? Is it easy to show grace when those that you are speaking to view you as a person who is intolerant, narrow-minded, a bigot, a nut job? It's not. But being respectful rather than snarky is so important. And why is that? Well, it's because grace, not humility, leads to genuine conversation. And not only that, but treating people with kindness and respect, we allow them the opportunity to encounter the living Christ who exists within us, whether they recognize that or not. Not only is our spirit important, but so is our motivation. Why did even Paul set out to share his faith in Jesus Christ with these two individuals who were clearly hostile towards Christianity? Why not just completely brush them off? Here's why Paul's heart was burdened for these men. Because he knew the emptiness of their life. Yes, in so many ways, they seemed to have it all together and have everything a person could want. They had money, and they had power, and they had fame, and they had education. But this is what Paul knew, whether they realized it or not, that life without Christ is absolutely empty. That it's nothing. And that steep concern for people is so evident in the way that Paul responds to Agrippa He just views it as absolutely incredulous that Paul would even go to the trouble of trying to convince him to become a Christian. Acts chapter 26 and verse 28 through 29. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Listen to how Paul replies. Paul replied, short time or long. I pray to God that not only you but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. More than anything else, Paul wanted every single person to experience the life and the joy and the peace and the hope and the purpose that is found in having a relationship with Jesus Christ. This must be our motivation as well. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Let's just be honest, there are some times when our motivation is less than noble. I'm reminded of this so often when I hop on Facebook and I see the dialogue between a person who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ and a person who is not, and it starts to get a little tense and it starts to get a little petty, and, and then all of a sudden it seems like this person who is out to share their faith in Jesus Christ cares far more about being proven right or protecting their rights than they do about the person that they are in conversation with. And that's not good. 
It's not good because people can see insincere motivation from a mile away. And if we desire for people to care about the ways of God, then we have to first show people we genuinely care about them. You say, well, that's the problem. The problem is, I just don't care. I mean, as long as my spouse and my kids and my friends spend eternity with God, I'm good with that. As long as they're there and I'm there, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. And as far as those who are hostile towards Christianity, then they get what they deserve in the long run. You ever feel that way? If, if you do, you're not going to admit it this morning, are you? <laughs> I'm not either. But I think there's many of us that struggle with those feelings from time to time. And so how do you keep a sense of genuineness and compassion for those that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, especially those who are hostile and antagonistic and maybe give you grief for being a follower of Christ? Well, first, I need, think we have to remember that, that God showed deep concern and care for us when we were living lives that were really antagonistic contra or contradictory to the life that he wanted us to live in him. But second, we must pray diligently for God to give us his heart for people who are far from him. So the right spirit and the motiv right motivation is so important in faith sharing, but so is the right method. And in our study throughout the book of Acts, we've noticed that the Paul's really used a lot of different methods to try to share faith with people who didn't know Jesus Christ. There were times that he made the decision, certain occasions when he decided uh, best situations to quote from the prophets in this particular environment. Then he gets to Ac or, or Athens, rather, and he decides, you know what? We're not going to quote scripture. We're not going to quote from the prophets. Here in this environment, we're going we're to choose a Greek poet, and that's who we're going to use to initiate a conversation about faith. For Paul, it seemed to be that he would look at his audience and he would decide, what's the best method to build a bridge the audience that is listening to me on this particular occasion. And so Paul's visiting with Festus and Agrippa, and what method does he decide to go with? He doesn't quote scripture right off, and he, and he doesn't quote from a poet, but he decides, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share my life story. And this appears to have been a favorite approach of Paul's, and it's so easy to understand why. Personal story is a powerful witness. That was true then, and it is just as true today. As Asa mentioned to us over the past few weeks, this past month, I think most of us have just been captivated, inspired by the Campbell stories that were shared. Powerful stories about amazing work of God in the lives of people. They're convicting. They inspire us. And I think that's true for so many people, not just believers, but I think it's True for those who are hostile towards the faith as well. That if you tell your story well, people will listen. And so how do you tell your story? What are the elements that are important? Well, I want you to think about your story in three acts. Here's act number one. What was, your life was like before you came to faith in Jesus Christ. What your life was like before you came to Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 26 and 4 through 11, Paul tells Festus and Agrippa what his life was like before he came to faith in Jesus, before his conversion. To quickly summarize, Paul shares that he was a smart, devout Jew who hated followers of Jesus Christ, that he had them arrested, punished, and he was all for their execution. That his life before faith in Jesus Christ, his time was devoted to hunting down Christians in an effort to make sure that this whole movement stopped. He couldn't stand the thought of people suggesting that you could come to a relationship with God through faith in Jesus rather than obeying the law of Moses and keeping the Jewish laws and covenants and traditions. I imagine that when Paul shared this part of his story with Festus and Agrippa. It was kind of difficult. This isn't a, a highlight of his story. This is one of those moments you kind of want to forget and put behind you and hope nobody else reminds you of this moment of your story. 
But in sharing this part of his story, he's able to convey to Festus and Agrippa, you know what, I, exa- I know exactly how you feel. Because at one time, that's how I felt. That, that was my stance towards Christianity, that, that I too hated Christians. I didn't want anything to do with them. I thought they were complete nut jobs as well. So what's your act one? Who were you? What was your life like? Some of you, like Paul, you have uh, these dramatic pre-Christ stories. Perhaps there's a part of you that's ashamed to tell that part of your story. As I mentioned, that's, that's the part you want to forget. That's the part you hope nobody will remind you of. That's the part you're saying, that's in the past. I, I don't want to talk about that anymore. And I, I understand that. And while shame may make it hard for you to talk about that part of your story, please know this. It is redeemed by God every time you use that part of your story to connect with those who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. For others of you, your pre-Christ story seems rather ho-hum in comparison. You grew up being taught that Christianity is reasonable. For three times a week, you were in a church building learning about Jesus. That's my story. Now, I imagine that's the story for many of you as well. And so, so what do people like us share? You still share what your life was like before you made the decision to fully devote yourself to Jesus Christ. For me, Act 1 is the story of being a good kid raised in a God-fearing home, but at the same time looking to accomplishment and stuff and the acceptance of other people for my security and happiness. The second act is your conversion to faith in Christ. We find Paul sharing the details of his conversion with Festus and Agrippa in Acts chapter 26 and verse 12 through 18. It's the story of a blinding light and a conversation that's life-altering with the resurrected Christ. God grabbed Paul's attention in such a dramatic way that Paul could no longer deny that Jesus had been raised. He could no longer deny that Jesus was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. He could no longer deny that Jesus is the only means to God through the Father, or to God the Father. And on that Damascus road, Paul came to realize that he would be the one who was insane if he made the decision not to devote his entire life to Jesus Christ. So what's your conversion story? How did God get your attention? What are some of the questions and the doubts that you had to work through before you could fully embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? For me, Acts 2 is the story of God speaking through loving parents, grandparents, friends, and church members to help me see that Jesus, not accomplishment, not sports, not stuff, not even the approval of other people was the true source of what my heart was searching for. These people taught me that I'm wonderfully made by God. And out of his great love for me, Jesus gave up his very life for me. At a fairly young age, I made the decision to put Jesus Christ on in baptism. But since that time, I've had Damascus Road moments in which God, through people and circumstances and discipline, revealed himself to me in such a powerful way that I recognize that denying him would be absolutely insane. How would you describe your act two? What's act three about? Act three is the story of your transformation since you made the decision to give your life to Jesus Christ. Now, if there hasn't been any transformation in your life, you might want to stick to apologetics, not to mention question your conversion story, because there should be transformation. Paul, in Acts chapter 26 and verse 19 through 23, he shares how he went from being a man determined to wipe out Christianity to being a man who was willing to pay any price to make sure all people could hear the story of Jesus Christ. And as I read this section, I want you to pay attention especially 
to how Paul weaves the gospel into this part of his story, beginning in verse 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. And that is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. That the Messiah would suffer. And as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. How has your life changed since your conversion? How has it changed? When you identify that, make sure you tell people. Tell people. The story of how God has changed your life, how he has changed your outlook, how he has changed your decision making, how he has changed your own personal character, how he's changed your priorities. This can have a profound impact on the lives of other people. As one author put it, it, speaking of the story of your transformation, it doesn't have to be dramatic. It just has to be brief, focused, coherent, and true. I like that. Remember that one, okay? It needs to be true. Part of Act 3 for me is the story of how God transformed me from being a person who was an approval addict to finding peace in the knowledge that God approves of me. Now, that's not to say that I don't still battle this urge or this necessity at times to seek the approval of other people or the positive feedback from other people to be okay, but it's not nearly as strong as it once was because of God's work in my life. He's changing that. He's transforming that in me, and I'm so thankful how has your life changed? In the book, Just Walk Across the Room, the author shares what to do and what not to do in sharing your life story. And I think they're kind of great things to keep in mind as we close this out. And, and worship team, I'd invite you to come back to the stage. We'll finish up in just one second here. But here's the first thing he says. He says, when thinking through your story, identify the single key concept reflected in your life that is germane in the ear of someone living far from God. So for instance, the one key concept that I hope that you picked up in the little brief part of my story that I've shared with you this morning is this. It's the concept of acceptance. It's the concept of significance. That's what I was looking before, for before I knew Christ. That's what I was taught I could find in Christ. That is what is changing me since coming to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. What would you identify as that one key concept or theme in your particular story? Spend some time this afternoon thinking about that, praying about that, asking the Holy Spirit to put that concept on your heart so as you think about how you, you begin to form this story and, and you prepare to share it in a brief, coherent way, you know where you want to leave that person to. See, for me, I believe significance and acceptance is something that just about every person is searching for, believer and non-believer alike. And so that's part of what I want a person to hear that they find in a relationship with Jesus Christ. The second thing the author says is really a warning, and he says this, avoid being long-winded, unclear, using insider language, and acting superior. That's good advice, isn't it? I mean, who wants to listen to an arrogant windbag? The answer would be nobody. And so you want to prepare the story, write it out, rehearse it, practice it, think about it. How do you share your story about how you came to know Jesus and the difference he's making in your life in two or three minutes in just a very humble, gracious, kind, respectful way? If we will learn to tell the story of God's work in our life with the right spirit and motivation, it has the potential to lead others to make the decision that being a follower of Jesus Christ is the most sane decision a person could ever make. 
Thanks so much for being with us this morning. If you're watching online, we appreciate you tuning in every Sunday. If there's something we can be praying about for you this particular week, we'd invite you to email that to us and know that we'll be praying over you and your family. Or if you'd like to have a conversation, uh, give us a call. We'd love to meet with you at any time. For those of you who are here, thank you so much for being here today. If you'd like to pray with one of our shepherds, uh, following our song this morning, our shepherds and their spouses will be around the auditorium, auditorium out in the patio area out front. Feel free to spend just a moment in prayer with the, a couple or an individual. If you'd like to, out, to write down your prayer request, mm -hmm. very back underneath the soundboard is a table. There are prayer re request cards. Once you fill that prayer requ request card out, there's a little box you can place that in. We'll be sure to collect those today and make sure those prayer requests get to our shepherds and our staff. We'll be praying for you this week. It's so good that you are here this morning. If you're a guest this morning, let me express my appreciation to you for spending time with us today. I'd love to have the opportunity to meet you briefly, uh, just get your name and learn a little bit about you. And so I'll, I'll be out here outside if you have just a moment. If not, pray that you have a wonderful week. Let's stand together and praise the Lord at this time. Thank you. 